Welcome to another edition of the Hawk Off the Press podcast. I'm your host, Gazette Hawkeyes reporter, John Steppe. I am joined today by Amy Wilson, the Managing Director of Inclusion at the NCAA, Christine Grant's last PhD student as well. And Iowa suffered the loss of a Title IX pioneer this month with Bonnie Sladden, one of the people along with Dr. Grant, that really made huge strides for opportunities for women in sports. And Amy was generous enough to give her time to talk about Bonnie's legacy. Amy, thanks for joining me. Thank you, it's so good to be here with you today. So what was the first time that you met Bonnie Sladden? Yeah, so the first time I met Bonnie was in August of 2004. I had left a job as a college uh, coach and senior one administrator, and I was also teaching in the English department at a small college and decided to, I'm going to go get my PhD at Iowa. I had read about Dr. Grant and really wanted to study with her and to learn Title IX. I knew she was teaching, even though she had retired from being the longtime women's athletics director at Iowa. And so I had read a little bit about Dr. Slatton because I knew she would be on the faculty but I met her at the orientation for the graduate program. And I remember she came over and put her arm around me and said, you have an English degree like I do. We have something in common. And I, you know, I'd like to talk more with you about what you've been doing and why you're here. And I was just immediately taken by how invested she was in just hearing my story and, um, you know, wanting to know what I was there and what goals I had and what could she do to support that. So it's a very fond memory of, of just feeling very welcomed at Iowa and thinking, wow, I get to study, you know, with, with this person. I was super excited. And I think a lot of people know the story of Dr. Grant, which has been well told, I think, by a lot of people. But I don't think people know as much about Bonnie Sladden's impact. What impact did she have in the 1970s on women's sports? You know, you're, you're right. Uh, certainly, I think Dr. Grant's story is more well-known, and I think a lot of that has to do with the amazing platform of women's athletics that she led and was front and center on. What I can tell you, and I heard her say it often, is that one of the things that Christine Grant would say um, often was that uh, Dr. Bonnie Slatton and Dr. Peg Burke both um, were essential to, to much of the work that she did and that much of it was a team effort. So, um, you know, Dr. Peg Burke was also a professor in the department went through many names. Um, it was the Department of Physical Education. It was the Department of Physical Education and Dance. When I came there as a graduate student in the early 2000s, it was then health and sports studies. But whatever we want to call it, it was a department um, that prepared people to work in different sport disciplines, right? And so what I'll say about Bonnie is she was had finished her PhD in the late 60s in the program and then was, was teaching in it when Christine Grant arrived from Canada to start her PhD. So Bonnie and Peg were both there as faculty members and were already doing really important work for women's athletics. And so um, they really all, as as women's athletics grew with the passing of Title IX in 1972, uh, Bonnie, Peg, and Christine were right there at the forefront to be national leaders. And so what we'll see Bonnie do is be an extraordinary leader in academics. Many people don't know that from the late 70s until the late 80s for over a decade, that the University of Iowa's Department of Physical Education and Dance sponsored a women and leaders conference that was nationally known where they had key speakers and it was very important academic um, work coming out of that conference that was um, helping to understand women entering sport and the obstacles that were there and, and what they needed to be able to flourish. So she was clearly an academic leader. She also served as executive director in the late 70s of the Association for Intercollegiate Athletics for Women, or the AIAW, which Dr. Burke and Dr. Grant were both president of. Iowa is the only institution in the country to have more than one person serve as a key leader in that institution. It really points to um, what University of Iowa was able to do. So she was a key leader in the first organization that organized women's college sports. She was a key academic, and she went on to serve on very important NCA committees, the US Olympic Committee, And she was a faculty athletic rep to not only the Big Ten, but also to the NCAA. So 
um, you know, lots of contributions on um, not just the regional or local stage at Iowa, but on the national stage as well. She seemed to be, from what I've heard, somebody who didn't exactly mince words either. <laughs> she didn't. Um, she got to the point and she was not afraid um, to, to ask a challenging question. It's the way she taught, right? She, she didn't say a lot in the classroom. Um, she made us defend our views and, and made us explain from where we were coming. She was getting us ready for what was going to face us in the real world. And so, no, but she did it in a way that was graceful, um, that, that was, you know, elegant. I mean, she did, she had a way of making her point, um, without being the loudest one in the room, without shouting, um, you know, and it was always so thoughtful. It was always like, gosh, I think I maybe could have said something like that if I'd gotten to think about it for two days and you just said it, you know, with 30 seconds notice. So, um, she was, she was just gifted intellectually and she was, um, so committed to, her students at Iowa, the success of athletics overall at Iowa, um, you know, and, and again, to making a difference where she could on the national scene. And then for people who don't know, the AIAW was mm -hmm. really big in the 1970s. I believe at one point they had more members than the NCAA. They did. In 1980, they had more members. And part of that has to do with it was the Organization for College Sports for Women, Whereas the men had the NCAA, the NAIA, and some other organizations. So schools belonged to the AIAW. And um, it was a really neat organization because its, its whole principle was a focus on the enrichment and the well-being of student athletes. And so the way they ran the organization, all volunteers, by the way, all had full-time jobs, just like Dr. Grant, Dr. Slatton, and Dr. Burke did at Iowa that found a way to run that organization and focus on student athlete voice and welfare. Um, you know, students had the ability to transfer things that we're working on now. <laughs> the AIW is ahead of its time in many ways in terms of just a student focused model for athletics. And we see the NCA over time adopting some of those principles. And I wrote my dissertation on the AIW and um, the, one of the great benefits of that was I got to spend a lot of time with Dr. Slatten, along with her friends, Dr. Burke and Dr. Grant, because they were key leaders of, of that organization. So it's a really important part of history, not just women's history, but history overall um, for athletics in our country. It really is. What would have happened, do you think, if the AIAW wasn't there and let's say the NCAA earlier than they did took over women's sports? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you, you introduced me at the start. Um, I do work for the NCAA. My salary is contingent on working on diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I will say the NCAA, while still having improvement to make, has certainly um, switched its opinion of, of what needs to happen. As I said, a work in progress, and that's another subject that we can talk about. But what I will say is that what a lot of people don't know is that the AIW was formed in 71. Title IX was passed in 72. And when Title IX was passed, no one was talking about athletics. It was a law about access to education. And so once we hit 73, we had Billie Jean King and the battle of the sexes and a lot of you know, things like that happening, there started to be a realization that maybe this law applies to athletics. Well, to quote Dr. Grant, when, when there was a realization across the country, especially in the athletics department, that resources and facilities and participation opportunities, opportunities were going to have to be shared because of Title IX, all hell broke loose. There was a major backlash. So in the 70s, the NCA fought Title IX. They tried to get rid of it or tried to exempt football and men's basketball or tried to say, let it, let it apply to other things in education, but not athletics. So much so that the NCA worked with different congresspersons to file amendments to the law. Title IX survived because there were advocates, particularly women leaders in the AIW who fought for the law. So one of the great ironies of the work of, of Dr. Burke, Dr. Slanton, and Dr. Grant is that they gave all that time and energy to fight for the AIW, saw it not survive because the NSA ends up offering women's sports, but Title IX did come out of that still, still pertaining to athletics. So I feel like if, if we hadn't had that strong Iowa leadership, if the AIW hadn't existed, I'm not sure where we are today with Title IX or where we would be with women's sports. It was such a critical time in history for the growth, not just at the college level, but the high school level and beyond. 
And then Dr. Sladden, along with Dr. Grant and Dr. Burke, they were some of those infiltrators then in the <laughs> 80s, right? When they started to get involved with the NCAA. Yeah, you're right. I love that word. Uh, and, and you know what? Um, Dr. Grant and Dr. Slatton, if they are hearing us now, are smiling because that's exactly what they were. There were a lot of, of women who walked away from sports after the AIW ended. They were they were pushed aside. They felt shunned. Not only did they lose their national organization when the NSA started women's sports in 81, 82, at many athletic departments, they, they combined the departments. There were no longer a separate men's and women's department, right? So when that occurred, women were either moved out of athletics or moved below the male athletic director who got the run, got to run the whole show. So women were disenfranchised in so many ways. Thank goodness for the leadership at Iowa, for Sandy Boy, right? For the leaders who said, we're going to keep our separate. And, and Bump Elliott and Christine Grant found, found a way to work together. And instead of walking away, what Dr. Grant, Dr. Burke, and Dr. Slatton said was, we're going we're gonna to go get on those NCAA committees and we're going to push for change in the system. You know, um, we're not going to walk away and just let whatever happened happen. And so thank goodness that that there were those who, who were willing to do that like them. And you see their influence on various things, right? From academic reform to uh, Dr. Slatton served on committees that looked at infractions and, and looked at, at, at you know, how rules should be followed in the NCA. They were very um, involved in the late 80s, 90s, into the early 2000s and very important work at the NCA. And now with you having the position you have with the NCAA, how influential is Dr. Slatton <laughs> in your course of work now? Yeah. So the course I had with Dr. Slatton um, that I remember the most was a philosophy of sport class. And she made us deal with, with really hard issues that are still issues today. Things like, you know, drug use in sport, the concept of amateurism in sport, should student athletes be paid? I mean, a lot of things that I studied with her in 2005 are still hot button issues. And she made us take both sides of issues and make arguments and go back and forth. And so I feel like it's been very helpful for me in terms of critical thinking and reasoning through complex issues. And the thing that, I, you know, that she left me with was, and Dr. Grant did the same, um, if you are a value-driven leader, you have that set of values by which you lead, and that affects your philosophy, your decisions, and that is very important. And there was no doubt that both of them and Dr. Burke were very student-centered leaders, right? They knew that the reason they were teaching, administering in this work was for young people. It was for students, student athletes. And so I really carry that, that with me. Um, the largest room at the NCA, our ballroom, where the whole staff of 500 meets, is the Christine Grant ballroom. So there's some irony for you, right? So when I sit in that room, I not only think about Dr. Grant, but I think about Bonnie Slatton, and I think about Peg Burke, and I think about the other great professors I had, Dr. Susan Burrell and Dr. Tina Parrott. There is a whole history of past scholars and current scholars teaching that came out of that program that are so influential on the sports scene. And now looking ahead, for somebody who's listening to this, what can they do to honor Bonnie Sladden's memory? Yeah, so, you know, um, much like Dr. Grant, she said this often, I think Bonnie Slatton was um, very dedicated to just the whole concept of educating and education and continuing to learn. So I think the best way we can honor them is to make sure we understand these key issues um, understanding laws like Title IX and how they work, that our votes reflect the things we value, that the things we advocate for and stand up for are important, that if we see something that isn't right, that isn't equitable, that we ask a question, and that we, we don't just stand and shout about it, but we find a way to effectuate positive change. That's what they did. When they saw something wrong, rather than just stand and yell about it, you know, they got to work and thought, how do we partner with others to fix that? So. I think that that's my encouragement, right? In our own spheres of influence and power, you know, what, what can we each do? If I'm a parent of a, of a high school athlete, you know, maybe I'm making sure that there is equitable treatment there, right? If I have a daughter on the tennis team or if I, whatever it might be, you know, um, those are things that we can do every day. And when we do those sorts of things, it makes it better for those who come after, right? So I think just being diligent about that is what they would hope um, that their legacy would be. Um, they'd love for the fight to be over. They'd love for you and I to be able to say, well, let's end the podcast. Everything's equitable. <laughs> We're all good. Um, but it's not the case. And so I think it's, it's persevering in those ways is that they don't want, 
rooms that named after them, like ballrooms. They don't need trophies. They, what they really want is for us to act on our values and, and to make the way forward for young people better. Well, Amy, thanks for joining me. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much. Now switching gears over to football here, Mike and I have been taking questions from our text message group subscribers for the post-game podcast. And we've gotten a lot of great questions from our readers. Unfortunately, we weren't able to touch on all of them last week. So I figured I'd hit on a few more here that I thought were especially interesting. You can join the conversation in our text message group for free. Who doesn't like free things? By going to joinsubtext.com slash Hawkeyes. One question is about, does anyone aside from Kirk think that Spencer gives the Hawkeyes the best chance to win? So players have been publicly very defensive of Petrus, but if privately there are other feelings, we're probably not going to hear those. They'll probably keep that to themselves. But in terms of staff, one interesting sign was Brian Ferentz's comments last week to us via Zoom. He seemed to have a different level of patience with Petrus after just the South Dakota State game, and that ended in a win. Obviously a lot different when you end in a loot, in a loss. And when I say different level of patience, it seemed to be a lower level of patience, not really making excuses for Petrus, saying things like how he had ample opportunity to throw the ball and that the offensive line issues really isn't an excuse. So I'd imagine though it would be rather than black and white in terms of, yes, Spencer gives Iowa the best chance to win. No, Spencer does not. I would assume it's probably a little more different shades of gray in the building, whether that be coaches or players, but certainly publicly players have in kind of by necessity been continuing to show support for features. So another question last year, the theme was complimentary football. What would you call this year's theme? And depending on what exactly you mean by theme, Iowa certainly always wants to play complimentary football in any season. So it's certainly an objective, but that obviously is not happening so far through two games. So I guess if there's one thing that seems to keep on coming up right now with the state of the offense, I think it really comes down to something as simple as you need to score points to win. And Iowa has been able to go one and one with 14 points through two games, but things are going to get tougher when you have Michigan, Ohio State, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Purdue. Those are all more difficult teams than probably than they've seen in either case, probably more difficult than Iowa State, even though it's hard to predict where exactly the Cyclones will go in Big 12 play. So, yeah, I'd say a lot of it is, yeah, you need to score points. Something as simple as that. Another question is about how you recruit a quarterback when you see Kurt Ferentz being so loyal to a player like Spencer Petrus who's not performing. And the irony is, so this came in on Saturday, then on Sunday, Iowa picked up a commitment from a 2024 quarterback, James Rassar. And that kind of goes to the unpredictable nature of recruiting. And I kind of bring up a couple points that, okay, you see the bad performance from Petrus that you would think would concern some recruits, but really you only need one to really be bought in per class, just because of the nature of the position. This isn't like defensive back or wide receiver where you might be recruiting a couple at one position group. You're almost always, especially in Iowa's case, going to take one quarterback per class. So as long as you get one to buy in, you're good. And Brian Ferentz, obviously his results as offensive coordinator have not been great, especially the last two years. 
But one strength that he does have is interpersonally being able to connect with people. And that's a good chunk of what recruiting is, is it's the interpersonal building a connection, building trust with a player. And the one other point, too, is you have 64 Power 5 programs, tack on Notre Dame, tack on a couple others that technically aren't Power 5, but are either going to be soon Power 5 or have been able to recruit at a Power 5 level. And you still have only a finite number of opportunities to be able to go if you want to go the Power 5 route. So that means that by nature, you would expect Iowa to get one of the top 70 quarterbacks in one year or another. Then another question is, is there any hope for the rest of the season after the two disappointing results? And I think that depends on your level of expectations. If you want Iowa to go to a New Year's Six Bowl, okay, that's a little unrealistic at this point. If it does happen, run to Casey's or come and go and buy your lottery tickets. But there are certainly some positives. And I think bowl eligibility is certainly something that's possible. So you'd obviously rather get a nicer bowl. And I think it's possible they can avoid the quick lane bowl. I see that as a frequent projection. I think Iowa can do a little better than that. But it requires the offense to really improve. And historically, it's difficult to win when you have such a lack of offensive production. So, yeah, it's a, certainly not a rosy picture right now. I think bowl eligibility is realistic. And We'll, yeah, we'll see how far up they can go in terms of level of bowl, but it's probably going to be a step down from the Citrus Bowl. I personally would rather not have the Quick Lane Bowl, considering I'd rather not spend my Christmas Day in a hotel in Detroit. But there are some positives. It's a lot of kind of doom and gloom right now with the offense, but there are some things that Iowa can be happy about punting. Obviously, Tory Taylor has been exceptional. The defense has been strong to be able to only allow 13 points in two games. Of course, things are going to get harder, though, for the defense when you're playing Ohio State, when you're playing Michigan, and especially if you have to be on the field as long as they've been, especially against Iowa State. But one positive I will point out that maybe hasn't gotten a lot of attention is the benefits of having so much depth on the defensive line where they've been able to put in guys like Louis Stack. And the immediate thought when you bring up depth of defensive line, I think a lot of people jump to, well, that's good. The guys won't be tired in the fourth quarter. And there's certainly a benefit within games in terms of stamina left. But there's also a important benefit when you look at more at a larger scale of a 12 game season in a very physically demanding sport. And here's what defensive line coach Calvin Bell had to say about that this week. It's a, I tell the guys it's a long season and, and I don't say that begrudgingly. Um, I say that, but so, so to put them in the mindset that it's, you know, it, it's not a sprint and that what's going on, what, the, what's happening right now is actually going to set us up and, and help us later on. Um, I was talking with uh, Broderick Benz um, last week, and he talked about uh, back when he played with Claiborne and those guys, when they had five, maybe six deep, sometimes seven, that, okay, week one, week two, yeah, this is good, but week 11, week 12, all right, you're still sending the same five guys out there. There's, the tread is about worn off that tire. So absolutely, from a longevity standpoint, over the course of 12 games uh, th that were guaranteed, the rotation, as long as guys are healthy and guys are productive, the rotation will be beneficial for us all season long. Thanks again to everyone for their great questions. And thanks again for tuning in. Again, you can join the... Gazette's Hawkeye Sports Update text group. Again, it's free by going to joinsubtext.com slash Hawkeyes. 
I also want to bring up that the Gazette is giving away tickets to the Iowa Wisconsin game. So really nice seats from what I've heard. And of course the season is sold out. So you're getting quite a bit of value there. All that you need to do to be entered in is to be subscribed to our weekly newsletter. And if you're looking for more details on the contest, I tweeted out a link on Thursday and in this week's newsletter, I'll also have that mentioned as well. So on behalf of producer Nathan Ford and myself, thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Hawk Off the Press podcast. Until next week, we will talk Hawks later. 